focus today is on healthcare for and understanding of the unique needs of transgender individuals in order to help us as healthcare providers deliver affirming, compassionate care. With an array of controversial and elevated national conversations related to the transgender community, we must find a way to provide guidance to healthcare professionals to, to work with the 1.4 million people in this community to ensure that healthcare settings are a safe place for all and to ensure that we are providing the best possible healthcare for these individuals. I'm pleased to be here today with our special guest, Dr. David Rosenthal. Dr. Rosenthal is the founding medical director of the Center for Transgender Care, the medical director for the Center for Young Adult, Adolescent, and Pediatric HIV, and attending physician in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Northwell Health. Last year, he wrote an article on the topic we are discussing today. He noted that we must learn the power of asking the right questions, listening carefully to the answers, and using them as a starting point for honest discussions about all aspects of a patient's well being. We're so pleased to have him with us to share his thoughts and join us in this conversation. Welcome, David. Thanks so much, Judy. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so pleased to be able to, to join you today and to be able to talk about this really important topic for our community. So there's been some really interesting work that's been done around transgender health. I think one thing that's important for us to realize is, is that when many of us went to medical school or our original medical education, we really didn't ever receive education about these topics. So this is something that we really need to start learning about now, understanding how we can really take care of these patients and really make sure that it's important that we can really engage with this topic. I think that more recently, we've seen a lot more individuals that are in media and that are being presented through um, our channels where people are kind of seeing individuals that are the trans experience and really understanding that a little bit better through TV and other things like that. But also within our healthcare settings, there's really important changes that are happening and they're driven from a federal level as well as at a local level and an area of recognition. Um, the Federal Register put out in 2015 the CERT, the 2015 CERT, um, which really requires us to in capture information about gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, in many states, including New York State, we want to make sure that we're not discriminating based on sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation, among other things. Um, and then there's also the Joint Commission, which is going to be looking at our hospitals and our healthcare settings. And then there's additional awards, honors, and, and recognition that's being sought after by the Healthcare Equity Index from uh, the Human Rights Coalition, Diversity.inc, and other places. And all of these things really speak to our confidence and our ability to engage the LGBT community and the trans community in the work that we're, we're doing. One of my favorite um, images is actually of three children looking at a baseball game. And two of them, there's a fence that's standing there in front of them. Um, one of them actually is on a little block and they can actually only see the fence. The taller child can see over the fence and the even taller child can see way over the fence. And this is what we're used to saying is we provide equal care to everyone. We give them all a block to stand on so they can see, but the problem is the outcome is different. So the next piece really in that image that we look at is actually taking a look and the, the, boy, the children are standing actually on two blocks for the shortest individual and the, the tallest individual doesn't have any blocks underneath them. So they can actually all see over the fence right now, but they have to look over this picket fence. What we're trying to do with healthcare is we're trying to remove the barrier. We're trying to remove the fence. And the third image that you can see right here is actually of people looking through a chain link fence. And this means that none of the children, none of the individuals need assistance in order to be able to access healthcare. And so this is setting a standard that we really provide through all of healthcare where people can get equitable healthcare by just being themselves because the setting that we're providing allows everyone to be able to access healthcare equally. And that really is important because when we take a look at it, we all grew up in an environment. Some of us grew up in religious environments, some of us grew up in other locations. And we all kind of come to the world, we come to practicing medicine with unconscious bias or implicit bias. And so what we have to do is we have to recognize the implicit bias that we all have and be able to overcome that so we can really treat patients equitably and really provide the kind of care that we need to do because we all have certain culture and experience that we come from. And we do that through what we call the pause model. We pay attention, acknowledge assumptions, 
understand our perspective, seek different perspectives, and examine options to make decisions. And that lets us help overcome our implicit bias or our unconscious bias and really address the community that we need to serve. The reason this is so important is there are millions of individuals in the United States that identify as LGBT and probably a million or so that identify as being transgender. And it's important that we understand the vocabulary, the terminology and the work that we need to do to really help take care of this community. One of my favorite models is the gender bred person. And the gender bred person helps us identify different aspects of one's gender. And when you take a look at it, um, Cecilia Gentili, a trans activist and actually an actress in Pose uh, who identifies with the trans community taught me that your gender identity is what's between your ears, not what's between your hips. That's almost funny, right? If you think about it, your gender identity is what's between your ears, not between your hips. It's very smart. <laughs> right? And so I think that what you need to think about it is, is you can't look inside someone's head. You can't understand what their gender identity is unless you're able to ask them and you're able to talk to them. Just like the patient that's across the desk from you at a reception area, you don't know what their race or ethnicity is, what their preferred language at home is. You can't tell these things by looking at someone. So what's critical is, is we're able to ask people what their gender identity is. And by doing that, we can really engage them for who they are. So what we wanna talk about is, is really the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. See, gender identity is the sense of oneself being masculine or feminine. It involves your personal, your societal roles. Whereas your sexual orientation is who you're romantically, sexually, or affectionately attracted to. So I have a patient, for example, who may be transgender. And if they are transgender, then their sex assigned at birth is one thing, let's say male, and their gender identity is female. So when the sex assigned at birth is different than the, gen, than, than the current gender identity, then these individuals are considered to be trans or transgender. And if we think back to organic chemistry or our sciences or any Latin that you took or whatever, things that are in cis formation are on the same side of the carbon molecule and things that are on opposite sides of the carbon molecule are in trans formation. So really what we're talking about is people who have a different gender assigned at birth, a sex assigned at birth than a gender identity. And we call it sex assigned at birth because when the baby comes out, the baby is delivered, at least on TV, right? You, the, someone holds up the baby and says, it's a boy or it's a girl. The baby doesn't say, hi, I'm a boy. It's not something that comes from the child. It's something that literally is that we're being, we're placing as a societal construct based on external genitalia. So it's important for us to remember that there's differences between um, sex assigned at birth and gender identity. So as part of a healthcare setting, we need to capture both of those elements, sex assigned at birth and gender identity. And so really within an electronic medical record, we actually need three elements. The three elements are gonna be your identification on your insurance card or your legal identification. That's important for billing purposes. That's our old gender or sex field that we've collected for decades. It's already in our medical record systems. But we have to collect two other fields and those two other fields are gonna be the sex assigned at birth and the gender identity. It's actually very simple. If you are assigned male at birth and you identify as anything but male, then you're in the gender diverse community. And so we need to make sure we're asking you what pronouns do you wanna use, what name do you wanna use, and what is your gender identity? So these are important things for us to understand and to be able to differentiate. So even going back and thinking about the trans community, it really breaks into several different groups. Um, so we talk about the LGBT community is kind of an umbrella. We talk about the queer community is sort of an umbrella. And then within the trans community or the gender diverse community, we talk about several elements as well. So there are individuals that identify as trans feminine or, or trans women, and those are male to female or MTF individuals. And those are individuals that were assigned male at birth whose identity is female. And we have individuals that were assigned female at birth but identify as male. Those are trans masculine individuals. And that's important for us to realize that those individuals exist also. And then there's a third category, people that are genderqueer or gender fluid or non-binary. And those are individuals that are assigned male or female at birth, and they don't really necessarily identify as strictly male or female. They may change, they may be a little bit gender fluid, they may be right of, um, they may be a little bit mas masculine leaning, but it's important for us to realize those populations are, are very important as well. And there's a third organization that kind of falls slightly outside of the trans umbrella, but associated with it, and those are gender non-conforming individuals. And those are people that don't um, 
unambiguously assigned to a conventional notion of male or female. So all of these populations exist, and it's important that we really are able to recognize and really take care of all those individuals. And really, when we're taking a look at um, that, we're able to kind of understand the diversity that exists right there and be able to teach that. But the reality is, is that this isn't something that we learned in our primary education. This isn't something that we learned in medical school. And this isn't someone who is over the age of 25 or whatever necessarily learned through culture that they were involved in in their individual societies. But it is something that our younger generation of physicians and nurses, providers and receptionists are learning about and are hearing about in their, in their social settings. When you go to a college campus, often people are introducing themselves with their names and pronouns. And so we need to be aware of this and make sure that as we train the next set of physicians, we're incorporating capturing a sexual history in a very appropriate way, just like we capture a substance abuse history, or just like we um, capture other histories. Um, because the reality is, is that we can't assume heteronormative cisgendered ideology or an identity when we're looking at people, we really need to understand people for who they are and understand that people are diverse and that we're able to kind of take care of individuals that are diverse. Because if you don't ask the right questions, if you're not there to be able to um, understand your patient, then you're not gonna really be able to provide the right kind of preventative health care that's gonna meet their health care needs and really be there for them across the board. There are several elements that we know that are really um, disparities that we see within the trans community. We see issues of mental health, housing and food, education, substance abuse, tobacco use, intimate partner violence, and HIV, which all fall in higher um, numbers within the trans community. And one of our goals is really to ensure what we can do to make sure that we can reach patients where they are and address the social determinants of health, as well as their medical preventative health care to help keep them happy and healthy throughout life. Um, most of the things that trans individuals need is healthcare like everyone else. One thing that really concerns me is, is when a provider or a doctor says, and I have patients that come to me all the time that says, I can't take care of you because I don't know anything about that. Well, if you're treating hypertension and you're treating diabetes and you're treating COPD, you know everything about that. And these patients are patients just like every other diabetic hypertensive patient with COPD that you take care of. And it's really important that you can address what's going on with their health. I understand people are not endocrinologists and may not understand all the details about hormone affirming care, but it's really important that our patients can receive equitable care and that their hormones are not the cause or the blame for every one of their medical issues and that we address them appropriately. So there are several things that we can do in our healthcare settings that really make this easier. One of them is, is really to make sure that when you introduce yourself to a patient, I say, hi, I'm Dr. Rosenthal. Um, I use he, him pronouns. How should I refer to you? It's very simple. The patient will immediately say, call me Mr. Smith or call me Johnny, even though my chart says my name is Jane. Mm -hmm. I use he, him pronouns. Let the patient tell you in their voice what's going on. You'll still be able to validate what's in the medical record and make sure you've got name and date of birth to make sure you've got the right patient there. Just say, oh, great. So you like to go by Johnny, but the medical record here says Jane. Is that what your medical record is supposed to say? And I'll say, yeah, that's what my legal name is, but I go by Johnny. I'm like, great, Johnny. I'll be happy to use he, him pronouns and refer to you as Johnny. It takes nothing away from us as medical providers to open a conversation in an emergency room, in a doctor's office, or any other setting in the hospital to really make sure that we can address patients and make them feel comfortable in our settings. And there's really some other important information that, that we can capture and we can really take a look at. There's a wonderful video that you should take a look at that's also on YouTube. There'll be a link at the end of this presentation, I hope, um, to Vanessa Ghost, the doctor. It's put together by the LGBT Cancer Organization, um, and it really is an eight-minute video. In the first two minutes, it actually talks about the bad doctor's office experience. The, the second two minutes talks about the good front desk experience. The next two minutes talk about the bad doctor patient experience and the last two minutes talk about the good doctor patient experience and in those eight minutes and 26 seconds you can learn a lot of very very key facts about how you can make your office affirming and supportive for the trans community or the lgbt community at large really things that you can do that are very simple um, to make sure that people are comfortable in your settings um, using forms that, that that document people's gender identity and their preferred names making sure your single stall restroom, say all gender restroom or gender neutral restroom so people feel comfortable going there, 
Don't always refer to people as Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith or sir or madam. Really refer to them by the way that it's gonna be most comfortable for them. And make sure that you're creating health promotion and, and information about their health that really reaches their healthcare needs. We have to address all of these things and teach our next generation of physicians, both through CME that are currently physicians and through medical school education, the resources we need to do to really address all of these topics and a lot more to help people really achieve the health equity they need and receive the kind of affirming health care that they really are looking for. Um, I think together we can really accomplish this and I really look forward to talking about more details and specifics with you. Great, that was a, a, a really wonderful overview of, of what we need to do in, in for health professionals to provide the compassionate, safe and good, great care to the transgender uh, community. Um, you know, it goes so far beyond uh, asking about pronouns um, and, and you uh, pointed us in that direction and, and I look forward to looking at some of these resources. I read recently that about a quarter of the transgender population are uh, afraid, or maybe afraid is too strong a word, but are concerned about sharing their gender identity with the clinician, the person who is providing them care because of uh, fear of being judged, of, um, you know, there are so many reasons uh, both, but it's so important that the clinician knows because there are many unique kinds of medical issues as well as just the regular kinds of things that you would um, do in a, a general clinical setting. But, um, but so, so tell us a little bit about, you know, what some of those uh, unique issues are and why it's important for, um, for the clinicians to be able to, um, to understand uh, what the person's gender identity is. So I believe in kind of a model, and I've, we've adapted this at Northwell Health, it originally came from the Henry Ford Clinic, and, and we adopted the model, we ask because we care. And I think if you think about that as the underlying tenant that we're kind of looking at, we are gathering the information because we truly care about our patients, and we want to make sure we're understanding what's happening with them and make sure that we can address them. So in 2019, we actually were able to launch across over 600 medical practices, asking every patient that came into our ambulatory settings what their gender identity and their sexual orientation, their gender identity, sexual orientation, and their sex assigned at birth. And by getting that information, we can really affirm what's going on. Before I did that, actually, I was taking care of a patient for actually 10 years that had asthma. Um, and the patient never was able to talk to me about their gender identity or their sexual orientation. But one day they saw that I was actually wearing a pen and it said he, him on it is my pronouns. And as I was able to, sh they saw that pen, they're like, oh my gosh, your pronoun, you know what, I know what your pronouns are now. I want you to use they, them pronouns for me. And I want to be, you to be able to see a picture of me wearing a suit when I went to prom um, with my girlfriend. Um, and this was actually someone who was assigned female at birth. It was that opening conversation that really let us be able to go down the path of being able to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, being able to take care of these needs of this adolescent by taking care of their asthma since they were a young child. And so it was these kinds of conversations that really make people feel comfortable. Um, a little sign on the door, a little LGBT ribbon at the front desk, these sorts of things create safe spaces for our patients to be able to talk about their gender identity and their sexual orientation. And it helps us ask better questions as clinicians and as providers. Um, one of the banes of my existence is, is that when I ask patients if they had testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia, they say, yes, I was able to urinate into a cup or I was able to pee into a cup. I said, well, that's great if we're only looking for penile or vaginal um, gonorrhea and chlamydia. If you're looking for anal or oral gonorrhea and chlamydia, we're going to miss it completely. And so I think a lot of doctors and providers just automatically, subconsciously, due to unconscious bias, assume that people are having heterosexual, heteronormative um, genital intercourse. And I think it's really important that we address the kinds of intercourse people are having appropriately. If you have a patient who has a vagina and let's say it's a neo-vagina and it was created, they still will have a prostate. So we still need to do prostate screenings. If patients have breasts, either because they had a partial mastectomy and they had those breasts mostly removed and they still have some mammary tissue, 
or if they were growing breasts later in life because of estrogen therapy, those individuals need to have cancer screening and mammography. So it's really important that we're able to do an organ inventory, ask patients what body parts they have, address people for who they are, and then design their healthcare specifically around their needs. And that's true of all of our patients, I think, across the board. Yeah, it's simply good preventive care and really, you know, do an assessment of all the organ systems that, that need to be reviewed and, and, and the preventive screening that we would do uh, for any patient of any gender. So thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a certain level of uh, discomfort for older health professionals who have never encountered um, uh, uh, transgender patients or, or not that they knew of. Um, and um, so, you know, how, how do we get beyond that? Because one of the problems is the, um, the older clinicians like myself are the teachers of the next generation. So how can, we, how can we get beyond that discomfort and how can we really address what's going on patient um, so that the, these, are, um, these are not special needs that we talk about, but it's imbued in all of what we do in, in our healthcare learning. That's a great question. And it's actually very funny. When I give a ground rounds lecture in a CME setting, and I've got a group of seasoned physicians that are sitting in the room, I ask people who has taken care of an individual as a patient that's a member of the LGBT community. And I'll get a couple of hands that will kind of tentatively raise up. I go to a medical school class and I ask the same question, who's taking care of a patient that identifies as LGBT? And even as a third year, everyone's hands goes right up in the air because everyone knows. So I think that part of it is, is there's an implicit discomfort or lack of comfort or just kind of, I'm not gonna ask, a don't ask, don't tell policy that I think that a lot of clinical um, providers have. And that's largely due to discomfort. And I think that really what we need to do is start being able to overcome that discomfort by being able to have these conversations. So one thing that we were able to implement at the, at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell um, is a curriculum that allows for a pedagogic approach where we provide some education at baseline um, to individuals in a large didactic session. But then we break people into these smaller groups and we have people go around with case histories and we have the individual, individual students in groups of five or seven be able to ask questions of me as the, the preceptor talking about what's going on. And the thing is, is that at the beginning of the conversation, you see the residents kind of, they're so uncomfortable, their body language is uncomfortable, they're, they're wringing their hands, they're trying to make sure they're going to say things right. But I think that the reality is, is if you talk to people as people, and it becomes part of your vocabulary, then those are things that become much easier for us. And so if someone says, you know, I saw one of the first people I saw said, I'm a... Um, AFAB, non-binary, um, masculine-leaning individual that I'm actively involved in a quad with um, a non-binary, um, feminine-leaning partner, as well as someone who is um, AMAB. And I looked at them and I said, okay, <laughs> tell me what that means. <laughs> and when we broke it down, it actually isn't that hard. This is someone who is AFAB, assigned female at birth, that identifies as being non-binary, masculine leaning, so identify more masculine, and they're actively involved with a partner who is a MAB, assigned male at birth, that is more feminine leaning, that's also non-binary, and they're actively involved in a quad, so they regularly have sexual relations with four people, and they actually map to see everyone who they've been with, and they keep track of it on an Excel spreadsheet to make sure that they're all being safe, and they're getting prep, and they're doing what they need to to have safe sexual relations. But if you get overwhelmed by that conversation and you just let it go, rather than engaging the patients and saying, tell me what that means to you, and you're able to kind of gather that information so that you can understand what's going on, that patient just told me a ton of information about them, stuff that they wanted to share with their doctor. We ended up starting that patient on PrEP. We did triple site screening. We were able to provide them with great medical care. And actually I got all four of them in the quad being seeking medical care, and none of them did before. So it's really important that we listen to our patients, we understand what's going on, and then we're able to kind of take that information and grow with it and be able to figure out how to best meet the needs of our patients. I think part of it is, is that we need to overcome our own unconscious bias. We need to overcome our own discomfort with talking about sex, talking about different kinds of sex, talking about different substances. And I initially did this, I think, when I was training in inner city Newark, um, when I was working with um, substance abusing populations. 
Um, you know, I remember walking out of an exam room once when I was a senior resident and I had a, an intern look at me and said, you just asked 50 questions about what kind of substances they use and how they use those substances or whatever, um, including how they clean their needles and all sorts of other things. He said, how did you know all of that? Did you used to use? And, and I said, no, 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 I didn't. But it's important for us to be able to understand what is going on with our patients so we can understand and communicate with them in a way that we can understand what's happening. And I think the same is true if you're getting a detailed sexual history or a detailed substance abuse history, we really need to be able to understand the terms, the vocabulary, the, the, the conversation that people have. One simple conversation is, is when I'm working with um, people that um, are men who have sex with men or with transgender individuals, people often say, um, I'm top. Now top means I'm an insertive partner a penile insertive partner typically, and bottom means I'm usually an anal receptive partner, but verse means that I do both. So even using the terms as a clinician, are you top, bottom, or verse, is a way of understanding what sort of sexual practices people have, comes off much more authentic and realistic to patients using vocabulary they're comfortable saying, are, do you have anal insertive sex? That sort of a question is not gonna be able to elicit the same kind of history. It's the same thing as you ask someone if they use marijuana. Have you ever smoked marijuana in your life? Well, you're going to get the answer. Of course not, right? But as you say, so how often do you smoke weed? Um, or saying, have you ever smoked weed recently? Or do you smoke weed twice a day? Do you use bongs, joints, or blunts? If you're able to elicit history in a way that is able to create that engagement with our patients, then we can provide better health care by our confidence as providers. And that's really the key message we have to think about. Well, that's incredible. Well, you know, in addition to the, the wonderful uh, work and the innovative work you're doing in the Northwell system, um, it strikes me that um, that it shouldn't be uh, unique, that this should that should this should be the norm. Do you know of other um, exemplary programs um, in in training of health professionals that, you know, that where they're doing things that are innovative and integrated in, into the curriculum? Absolutely, so I think at many medical schools, this is increasingly becoming something that, that's being taught. It's also showing up in the medical education literature, and we're starting to see this in many institutions. I think that some places have um, significant expertise and advocates that are helping it to come to the top of the curriculum. And I think other people, other places are slowly introducing it. Um, the challenge with medical school curriculum is, is that we have a finite number of hours that we have with our students. And so if you're going to add something new to the curriculum, then that literally means taking something out of the curriculum. Um, and so the question is, is how do we incorporate this and be able to figure out what's going on? And the methodology we were able to use is saying, this is teaching first year students how to get a, a social history. Because just like we offer a, a, a substance abuse history and a smoking history and a housing history, getting a sexual history is really important for us to be able to understand. Are we talking to our patient, Lizzie, who regularly has um, um, sexual intercourse with her girlfriend, Rebecca? Um, are they doing, what sort of behaviors are they practicing? Have they ever had a mammogram? We know that there's a decreased incidence of mammography in lesbians and in transgender individuals. Um, are they smoking? Because we know that individuals in the LGBT community have higher smoking history. So I think really integrating this conversation of, of establishing um, social in the first year is a critical part of medical school education. And thankfully, places are starting to do that. What we're able to do, though, is, is at our curriculum, we actually were able to incorporate it within a spiral curriculum that we're using. So that we're able to bring up this conversation where we're talking about HIV and HIV prevention um, in the second year, when we're teaching about antiretrovirals and talking about serving the LGBT community, talking about stigma, and actually hearing the voice of patients from the HIV community and patients on PrEP and patients that are trans and hearing their voices and understanding how that impacts them and how their interactions with healthcare setting interacts. Then we add it into didactics that occurs in the third year and working on adding in um, other parts kind of into the fourth year. So this isn't a one and done educational model. I think it's really important that we incorporate it within the spiral curriculum that we're looking through throughout medical education and create opportunities for overall competence for every medical student that's graduating and realize there are going to be certain individuals that are going to be fascinated and interested in this area. And those people can seek excellence in their training and education in this area as well. Yeah, I would I would add that um, everyone in the healthcare setting, uh, doctors, nurses, um, therapists, um, right down to the the receptionists, 
really need to to be brought into this um, and educated. So, um, a great point, actually. So, just really with that, I think that you know, I had a patient that actually had a phenomenal experience with their provider, but the front desk when they walked in the room, they're actually going for a hysterectomy. And I was told the story about someone that was coming in for a hysterectomy, and the front desk said you've got a beard. I don't know why you're in our office. You, I don't think that you're in the right location. And the patient was coming in as a trans man um, to get a hysterectomy. So I think that the experience that you have at the front desk can either make or break the relationship. Um, early on, I had an endocrinologist send a packet to a patient and address to dear Mr. Smith. Um, and that patient was identifying as Joanne Smith at that point and did not even see that provider and wouldn't even engage in healthcare after that moment. So I think that really creating this conversation and creating that opportunity is really essential throughout a practice. If someone at the security desk is not letting two mothers in to see their child um, that, are, that are there, if you're at a hospital, or if someone from dietary is going to misgender someone who's being able to have a, a, need a, a cart of food or a radiology technician, all of these points of, of access for healthcare are essential. And so it really is all about educating the entire healthcare team, not just the clinicians. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and um, you know, let's talk just a, a little bit. And I know this we could spend another hour on talking about the emotional and mental health needs of um, transgender people, and you know how there there's a dish, so much additional stress um, in, in you know what they encounter in their day to day lives. Um, how should the clinician approach that? Should we be uh, probing that? Should we be making referrals? What, what are your thoughts? I know there's a higher rate of uh, suicide or suicidal ide ideology, or, and you know, it's, um, so we, we really do need to be conscious of this as well. Yeah, absolutely. So actually published in M M M MWR um, from the CDC in 2019, we talked about transgender teens and basically 2% of high school students identified as being transgender. 35% attempted suicide, 35% were bullied in school, and 27 felt unsafe from going to school. So we really need to create safe locations in our schools, but think about that even more so in our medical practices. So I think that that's exactly what we need to be doing, is, is creating an opportunity for us to be able to create that safety, but also to probe mental health issues. We know that anxiety and depression are certainly higher. We're seeing higher rates of people that are on the spectrum and ADHD and individuals that are identifying as trans as well. We see individuals also with all sorts of other mental health issues, but the reality is, is not everyone who's trans has mental health issues. Some of them do and some of them don't. So we don't wanna stigmatize people that they have mental health issues, but I think as a routine part of our evaluation of individuals, we need to be able to assess and see what's going on. Someone that's trying to look more feminine may have an eating disorder and may actually often purge or vomit um, in order to kind of maintain more of a, a feminine shape or whatever. Um, but the concept you kind of started with was the concept of minority stress. And the reality is, is that by being part of a sexual health minority, there is an enormous disparity that exists and kind of a challenge that's placed on all individuals that are trans. You know, I was talking to someone who was trans, I was giving a lecture and they're a lawyer and I was a, a physician, we were teaching at, at uh, university together in a course that we were co-teaching. And they said, you know, it would be a lot easier if I could present the world as being cis. I wouldn't have all of these things to deal with. It would certainly be easier for me, but it's not who I am and I wanna live my authentic life. And so I think we need to realize that being authentic and living authentic lives are challenging and it's difficult. There's all sorts of additional stigma and that kind of is presented continually by society, in the workplace, by coworkers, by friends, by people you interact with and by the healthcare professionals. And this minority stress does play significant burden for both suicidal ideation and on um, self-harm for individuals, especially in the younger age cohort. And that's why it's so critically important that people get comprehensive health care and that we address mental health along with gender dysphoria simultaneously. I often talk about it being sort of a yin yang. There's this interdependency or interaction that exists between the gender issues and the mental health issues. So we have to address the gender dysphoria, but we also have to address the uh, mental health issues because they interact with one another. If you're not comfortable in the way you're presenting, it's gonna make you more depressed. But if you're so depressed that we can't address your gender dysphoria because you're suicidal or you're self-harming, 
then that's actually even more challenging. So we really have to address this across the spectrum. And I'm pleased that I'm able to work in my transgender program with you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, and um, therapists and social workers to really kind of address the mental health needs of our patients simultaneously along with their physical needs. Um, and I think that we've got to take care of patients as individuals, which include their regular medical problems, their routine screenings, their mental health issues, as well as any other problems that present for them medically. Well, that, that was a, a great summary. Thank you so much. You know, um, I think it was uh, Sir William Osler or Dr. William Osler um, who said, um, if you listen to the patient, the patient will tell you not only what is the matter with them, but what matters to them. And um, I think you've, you've set that out very nicely, but you've also indicated that we have so much work to do in the health professions. And um, I very much appreciate um, your, your broad overview, but um, pointing us in, in the right direction for how we can uh, deliver better, more compassionate and safe care um, and create a safe place in the healthcare system for transgender people. Any final comments? No, I just think that we need to remember that trans folks are people too. And I think that we sometimes get caught up in the politics of what's going on in this hyper-political world we're living in, um, or worrying that we don't have the knowledge. But I think that what we really need to worry about is, is that we do need to listen to our patients. We need to show caring for our patients. We need to ask the right questions. Don't probe or do physical exams for parts that you don't need to do for any other reason, but provide the right kind of health care that really addresses their medical needs and make sure that we're there for our patients across the board. It's so easy to call the patients by the name and the, the pronouns that they want to use. You just have to ask. And I think if we start doing some of those very simple things, then the door opens. And I think we're able to engage in a really active conversation um, and really being able to, like you said, be able to hear what the patient has to say and take care of what the patient needs so that we can truly be the kind of providers that we need to be for those individuals. Dr. David Rosenthal, thank you so much. We really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure.